So, I was 18 years old when I joined the Army, and it was within the same month that I graduated high school. Um, and just for a moment, let me, uh, let me say that although Vietnam happened in a different time and space than Iraq and Afghanistan, the language is still the same. And the, uh, the conflict and the political side of it are very, very similar. Uh, but I digress. So I was 18 when I joined the military. I had no future going for me. I was in a lot of trouble in high school. And there wasn't a whole lot of opportunities out there. And I just really wanted to escape where I was. I had some people that, um, that were on my side and that thought that, that was a great idea for me. Recruiters had been brought into our school, into our classrooms, and I had just joined the Army. You know, why not? I needed something to do. And all my life I've been hearing about freedom and democracy, and I see those commercials on TV with like the starving children, and, and uh, you see these films of these American soldiers, and I thought, wow, we really are the good guys. That We go and stop things like that. That's what America does. And we, we have it so great here with our democracy and our freedom and all those other catchphrases uh, that we want to give that to other people. We want to share the gift. So that was my naive belief when I was 18 years old. So I joined the Army, and it was just before September 11th. It was about four months before September 11th, and my job was a Bradley crew member, which is like mechanized infantry. And so right off the bat, there was a lot of, uh, of course, training that goes on in boot camp that uh, sets you up for that, that language and that uh, snap to of doing your job and, and killing somebody. And even in basic training, when there wasn't even a war to fight, we were learning about rules and engagement. There is a language of war that exists in, in Vietnam, I believe, and, and as well as in Iraq. Rules of engagement, the rules that you will follow to kill someone. So I'm going to fast forward through my military training in, in Mojave Desert and, and things like that. 9-11 happens, uh, 2004 rolls around, and I had just gotten married to uh, my high school sweetheart. And six months after the wedding, I was leaving for Iraq. I had only signed up for three years. They stopped, lost me, and took me for four. And uh, right away they were calling it Operation Iraqi Freedom. I didn't see it to be that much. <laughs> uh, an Operation Enduring Freedom in Afghanistan. But I deployed to Iraq, Baghdad, uh, where I deployed, I mean, where I uh, patrolled Route Irish, which is a stretch of road from the airport to the green zone. And it's a uh, Back then, it was one of the most dangerous routes, roads you could drive on Earth. There was no other road that was more dangerous than this, and we patrolled it every day. I think that uh, something that Barry and I have in common is that we both served during a time that if you go on the Department of Defense uh, website, you can see that statistically speaking, this was the deadliest time to be in Iraq uh, so far during the entire war. Um, I look, you know, through the language of war, I learned that these Arabs were Hajis. And that's what a lot of uh, the other men and even women in my unit, uh, it was predominant, there was only two females in my unit. They were a supply and, and a mechanic. And, uh, but even they called them Hajis. A Hajj is when somebody, I don't know if most of you know what a Hajj is. Um, when you go on a Hajj, it's when you go to Mecca and pay your tribute. It's a religious deal. But I still don't think it's right to just generalize and call them all Hajis, but certainly that's what they call them. And when we kill innocent people, that's collateral damage. Now, uh, I myself was on patrol one day, and uh, we were merging onto Route Irish, and a red car was coming at us. And so I fired a warning shot into the ground uh, as I'm riding an 1114 Humvee, uh, like the Humvees you might see in the film Black Hawk Down, that's an 1114 Humvee. So I was up in the turret, 
uh, with my rifle and uh, M249 machine gun. And I used my rifle to fire the warning shot the car kept coming. Uh, I took out both the tires on the car successfully. And the car kept coming, even with those tires gone out. And that's when I started pumping round after round into the windshield. Because suicide bombers had already killed a couple of my friends. Six people in my unit had already been killed. And so um, I started plugging away with that machine gun. And the car went off the road. And two females came running out of the back seat. They were wearing all black. No, almost not. <laughs> so they pulled the driver out. I guess the females are fine. They went off in a hollow. So uh, they pulled the driver out. The medic does. He's been shot multiple times. There was no <clears throat> explosive in the car. So. Yeah, he was crying on the road. I remember they cut open his Adidas pants and he was hanging with his ass out right there in the road for the whole world to see. That's how he died. So, after Iraq, I had done a few things like that, you know, a couple times. Not always uh, an innocent human being, but certainly um, uh, a squad size element, and I laid waste to a car, and the occupant dies. And sometimes there's explosives in the car, and they mean to harm us, sometimes not. But um, we just wanted to make home safe. And uh, there's no such thing as a surgical strike, you know. When we bomb places, plenty of children get hit. You know, I was just talking to somebody the other day about in Afghanistan, uh, when we invaded Afghanistan, not I, we, the royal we. Uh, they dropped, they had a deal with Kellogg's to drop food and weapons, how convenient. Well, a crate full of expired Pop-Tarts went right to the roof of a house and killed a baby in his crib. So, that's hearts and minds right there. <laughs>